Hello, this is a video on the monetary policy. It's the last policy that we look at in A2 economics, and this is just part of Unit 4. The transmission mechanism of monetary policy, also known as the TMMP, is a process by which change in interest rates affects aggregate demand and inflation. It's also the thing you write down when you don't really know what to say, so you just put these words down because they look impressive, take up space, and you feel really cool. So essentially the people on the Monetary Policy Committee, also known as the MPC, decide what the interest rate is and the interest rate they set can have sort of impacts on the economy. Typically the aim of the MPC is to reduce inflationary pressure, so to do this they can raise interest rates. Although at times such as now we haven't got particularly high inflation, we're actually below our target of 2%. So they're keeping interest rates quite low because they're trying to encourage spending in the economy. They want us to get moving again following the financial crisis. For those of you who watched my GCSE videos, you might recognise this diagram here. I think I've used it all the way through at GCSE, AS and now A2. It's essentially the functions of money. You'll probably be very familiar with them. Uh, it can be used as a medium of exchange, so that's exchanging the money for the product. So you might have a hamster, I might have got 10 quid. That's an exchange if we swap. It can be used as a unit of account, so you can give a product a monetary value. So you can say, my hamster is valued at... 27 pounds and that's money being used to essentially value it and then that allows comparisons so I could have another friend called Bob maybe who's got another hamster and he's like well my hamster's worth 28 pounds so you can make a comparison that way. Store of value, money will supposedly retain its original value over time. Obviously there's inflation and stuff to take into account but money tends to be a reliable sort of way of keeping money whereas as I say you had an orange an orange isn't going to keep its value over time it's probably going to rot or be eaten and finally a means of deferred payment so say you give me your hamster I could say well I will give you 28 pounds for it for example in the future maybe in 12 days time so essentially you can make a plan for giving a certain amount of money at a certain point in the future and that's using it as a means of deferred payment. I'm not sure when any of this is going to come into use, but that's ways to split money. You can also split money by liquidity. Liquidity, I don't even know if I pronounced that correctly. But liquidity is essentially the degree to which financial assets can be easily converted into money. So say I've got something in my pocket. If it can be converted into money really quickly, that is a very liquid sort of thing. An asset, liquid asset. Whereas if I've got something like a painting, maybe, that takes a lot longer to convert a painting into money. Unless you're just one of those people on the street selling paintings. But expensive paintings tend to be a lot less liquid than, say, a cash share. So there's some things along the bottom there in how quickly things can be turned into money. Obviously, cash shares, you can very, very quickly um, sell it and get money. Current accounts might take a while to withdraw it. Uh, deposit accounts will take slightly longer because obviously you have to move it into a your current account or if it's in a deposit account you might have got something that have time you've got to leave it there for first treasury bills tend to have a date on so when you can get your money back and then property obviously takes forever to sell unless you sell it really cheap but that sort of thing the final way you can split money is into narrow money and broad money so narrow money is money that's immediately available for financial transactions so stuff that you carry back in your pocket really notes coins your debit card which is linked to your current account so that sort of thing. Whereas you might have broad money which isn't immediately accessible. So it's stuff you might have in a savings account or treasury bills, that sort of thing. I couldn't be bothered to make a slide for this, but you can also split money into financial and physical assets. So financial assets will be sort of cash, bank account, shares, that sort of thing. Whereas physical assets will be, I don't know, paintings, fine wines, stuff that people like you and I, if you are the same as I, which hopefully you're not because I don't really want a doppelganger. <laughs> Someone in my class is a doppelganger. They're a twin. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, um, things that you and I don't tend to have. I want to say that was a dreadful joke, but that wasn't even meant to be a joke. There are actually twins in my further maths class. Anyway, moving on to demand for money. Demand for money is typically determined by two major factors, income and the rate of interest. Obviously, if you've got a higher level of income, you're going to have a higher level of spending, therefore you're going to have a greater demand for money, because if you've got, you're getting more money in from whatever job you're doing, you've got greater disposable income, you're happy to spend more. So someone on a low income might not want to have, I don't know, a super soaker water blaster, but say you're on a higher income, then you might want one, so you're going to be more likely to want it, and in order to get this, 
you're going to need to do an exchange, as we said before, money acts as a medium of exchange, and so you're going to need to demand money in order to swap your money for a super soaker blaster or whatever it was called. On the other hand, money demand for money can also be determined by the rate of interest, which is set by the MPC, a monetary policy committee, and if we have a higher rate of interest, there's going to be a higher opportunity cost of holding money. So there's going to be a reduced demand for money. So say the interest rate is 5%, it isn't, but it could be. If you take your money out, you can buy stuff with it, but you can't get that extra 5% interest. And because 5% is quite high, you might think, well, the opportunity cost of taking my money out to, to like maybe you know have notes in my pocket or to spend it on maybe super soaker water blasters is going to be a bit too high, so I'm actually just going to keep my money in the bank. So when there's a higher interest rate, typically a reduced demand for money. And obviously it's the opposite way around if there's a lower rate of interest. Lower rate of interest, you don't get much extra money for keeping it in the bank, so demand for money tends to increase. This diagram here is all about the equilibrium rate of interest, which is when the demand for money is equal to the supply for money. The red line there shows the demand for money, and the green line is the supply. So say we have an increase in demand for money, the red line there will shift to the right. So we can see that there's been a rise in the supply of money. We assume that the supply of money is inelastic in the short run, hence the graph is vertical. In the long run, however, you can have an increase in the money supply. So that would be a right shift in the green line, which would actually lead to a slight fall in the interest rate. These are definitely some really important things to learn because these are great diagrams to just shove into your paper. They're quite quick to draw, but you can get up to two marks, I think, per diagram. So it's easy marks, really, and loads of extra marks for the explanation. It's quite a straightforward explanation. Here are just a few uh, rate of interest terms that might be useful to you. So the bait rate of interest is the rate that the bank sets to determine the lending and borrowing rates. So the bank might have a specific rate and... The lending rate tends to be higher than the borrowing rate. So if they're lending you money, they'll expect you to pay more interest since they're taking a bit of a risk in lending you the money. Whereas if they're borrowing money from you, which is essentially what happens when you put your money with a bank and in a bank account, then the rate of interest will be quite a bit lower because they're quite secure. The bank is a big organisation and hopefully they should be pretty safe so they won't give you as much money because it's not a risk for you putting it in the bank whereas it's a bigger risk for them lending the money to you well supposedly <laughs> obviously we learned that that might have been a slight mistake in 2008 but you know moving on nominal interest rates are essentially interest rates that aren't adjusted for inflation so say the interest rate for a bank account is three percent you think wow three percent but if interest uh, inflation is on target and it's two percent then you've only actually got sort of 1% interest rate uh, for a real interest rate. And if you look down there, the calculation to find a real interest rate is essentially the nominal rate of interest minus the rate of inflation. At the moment, because the rate of interest is so low, I think it's about 0.5%. I mean, the rate of inflation is low as well, but it's about one point something percent. So you're actually sort of losing money almost. The real interest rate is negative at the moment. My voice is actually really low in this video. I actually sound like a man. Like sometimes I'm really confused and people comment, are you a boy or a girl? But today I actually sound quite masculine. So I would forgive people for making that mistake. But for anyone listening who cares, female here. Female who likes cats. Now we're going to look at monetary policy objectives over time. This won't come up on the exam, or at least I hope it won't, because it would be a bit weird if it came up. But this is basically some of the objectives that it's had over time. And monetary policy objectives are essentially targets that the Bank of England aims to meet. So from the 1970s, I think it was late 1970s, to the 1985, monetarism was the big one that the monetary policy was interested in, which is essentially carefully controlling the growth of money supply. If you uh, read some of Milton Friedman's works, he talks a lot about monetarism. I think he was really in favour of really careful increase in money supply, and that was the power he wanted the government or the banks to have. So he was capitalist, very capitalist. Quite interesting and quite straightforward reading, actually, compared to some other stuff. He doesn't tend to beat about the bush compared to Adam Smith. I tried reading The Wealth of Nations and I just, after the first chapter, it was like, you've not said anything, you've just blabbed on. 
pages and pages, so I stopped reading. Uh, anyway, moving on. Essentially, before the bank had any control, there was quite a lot of large rises in the quantity of money holdings that people had, which led to an excess demand for goods and services, and that obviously pushed up prices, so we had some demand pull inflation there. So banks thought, hmm, let's control the money supply. And by trying to control it, which they found very difficult, they thought they would try to push down inflation, but it didn't really work particularly well. So in 1985, they thought, hmm, what shall we try? And then they thought, oh, I know, exchange rates. So they actually tried to get a high exchange rate, which uh, tends to, a lot of people think it's not too favourable to have a high exchange rate, because that means that your exports look quite expensive on the international market. But because the monetary policy's main sort of target is always inflation, if they have a high exchange rate, that's reducing the price of imports, so raw materials, which then goes on to reduce cost push to inflation. So say you're a Charlie and you've got a factory that makes bicycles and you're importing metal from Germany. It's better for you for there to be a strong exchange rate with Germany because that means that imports, so all the stuff you import from Germany to make your bicycles are going to be a lot cheaper. Anyway, for some reason in 1992 we gave up on this and we got a new target, which is price stability, which I'm pretty sure is the same one that we've got now. Target 2.0 the first thing they did was to place restrictions on high street banks' ability to supply credit and bank deposits and who could hold money and where and that sort of thing. They thought this would uh, limit increases in money supply and they also thought we need to put sort of regulations in place for who can be lent money so we don't have people being lent money that are just going to push up demand massively in the economy. They'd rather the people who are borrowing money be people who are going to invest rather than putting money into consumption. Also, they limited how much money could be lent so to prevent the sort of massive increase in the circular flow of money. They also tried to reduce the amount of money in circulation by selling bonds. So the Bank of England sold lots of bonds in order to decrease the money supply. So a bond is essentially a bit of paper that says you can have this much money in the future. So it's taking out money from the flow of income that's going around right now. And the Monetary Policy Committee still has the power to set the repo rate, which is essentially the interest rate that's set by the MPC in order to influence inflation. So it's the rate they set, and that's sort of the rate that all the other banks have to stick to. So say they've got high inflation, they'll usually set a high repo rate, so that'll lead to more saving, less borrowing, so a reduction in aggregate demand, and therefore less inflationary pressure. Whereas if they think there's insufficient aggregate demand in the economy and it needs picking up and that sort of thing, they'll set a low repo rate, which will lead to more borrowing and therefore more aggregate demand. Woo! The final slide. Information considered by the Monetary Policy Committee. Important to note there that it's very, very hard for the MPC to sort of predict external shocks and things that can happen in the future. So even though it might make forecasts for what will happen, they can be wrong. Sadly... But also important to note that two years is the time lag, roughly. People think it's somewhere between 18 months and 24 months that it takes for any changes at the MPC to have a real massive impact. Here we have a pretty rainbow of the information considered by the Monetary Policy Committee. Interesting to note that all of them start with a letter in the first half of the alphabet. I just had to check that that was right because it would be a bit embarrassing if I said that and then turned out I didn't know my alphabet. I'm going to try to go through these quite quickly and say the things that will lead to a rise in inflationary pressure, so things that lead to a rise. Financial markets all to do with share prices. If there's a rise in confidence, share prices will rise and that will lead to inflationary pressure. The international economy to do with trade of other countries, exchange rates, that sort of thing. If we have a weakening pound, a weakening pound, that leads to a rise in the price of imports, which is inflationary pressure. If we have money and credit... This is sort of to do with borrowing and stuff. If we have more borrowing and more withdrawals from circular flow of income, that leads to a rise in inflationary pressure because people have more money, so they're spending more money, increasing aggregate demand, pushing it up, and that leads to inflation. Demand and output, this is to do with GDP. If the growth of real GDP is too much, you might get quite a big output gap occurring and Big positive output gaps can lead to high inflation, sadly. Looking now at the labour market, this is to do with wage price spirals, that sort of thing. If we have a rise in wages, for example, the minimum wage might rise, 
firms might suddenly realise that it's more efficient to pay their workers more, that sort of thing. Anything that causes wages to rise will lead to inflationary pressure because workers will have more money in their pockets, they'll spend more, and that'll increase aggregate demand, blah, 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 blah. Finally, costs and prices, anything that causes a firm's cost to increase, for example, taxes, cost of raw materials from abroad increasing, cost of raw materials in the UK, cost of extraction of raw materials, uh, trying to think what else might cause a firm's cost to increase, if they get fined or something, I don't know. Anything that causes lots of firms' costs to increase will lead to cost push inflationary pressure. Probably not a good one to mention the fine because that's a bit more macro, not macro, microeconomic. But anyway, I suppose if you want to do some analysis of collusions and stuff, you could say that inspecting the collusion industry is one thing and giving firms fines and everything is, you know, quite a good idea because it prevents collusion which can keep prices high. But the imposition of these fines will cause a rise in the cost of production in the short term which could lead to bit of inflation in that industry so it's quite a weak point there Woo! you've made it do, 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 do. i nearly didn't make this video this evening because i was feeling kind of lazy but then i thought you know what you actually need to do some work danny so i made this video which is why you're sat there now watching it probably bored out of your mind you're probably fast asleep i'm probably talking to myself anyway hope the video helps you a bit and see you next time i think we're moving on to globalization or something fun like that have a lovely evening goodbye